Please stand at the reading of the gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson uh, comes from the gospel of John, chapter 20, uh, verses 11, no, I'm sorry, verses 19 uh, to the end. Reading in Christ's name. On that evening of the day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it on my, in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. And so as I said in the children's sermon today, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, but we will actually be looking at both of the other scripture lessons to kind of tie it all together. I really love the way uh, that the Holy Spirit led Peter to write these powerful verses in chapter one, verses three through nine. Our gospel lesson pretty much picks up right after uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, Jesus appears two times to his disciples, one without Thomas being in there, and the other, Thomas was there. There's an aspect of fear and there's an aspect of unbelief that Jesus deals with, and in his compassion and in his mercy, he gives them exactly what they need. But I think one of the extraordinary things, if you look at the gospel of John, the fear and the doubt, and then you look at Acts chapter five, the boldness and the incredible courage that they had in proclaiming the gospel of Christ, that transformation that happened from that locked room being fearful of the very man they're standing in front of in Acts chapter five, what happened? The transforming power of the Holy Spirit took these 11 ordinary men and made them courageous and unashamed to proclaim the gospel of Christ, even at the expense of losing their lives. That transformation is powerful, and I think it's something that I hope, I really hope it encourages us and maybe even kind of, oh, challenges us this morning. If you think about Peter, and the transformation that he went through from denying that he even knew Christ three times, being restored through the forgiveness of Christ Jesus, and then being one of the most powerful proclaimers of the gospel of Christ, as we see in Acts chapter 5, that boldness and that unashamedly um, preaching of the gospel of Christ, that transformation is something I long for. It's really something I crave in my own life. But Peter kind of encapsulizes all of that in our epistle lesson in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so I do pray a boldness and an encouragement through the assurance of faith in Christ Jesus would encourage us, challenge us, and strengthen us and preserve us here this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in our heart that which is pleasing to the Lord. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for these powerful verses May every word that proceeds from my mouth be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, 
And so the very first thing that we see here is the triune God's work of salvation revealed in Christ Jesus. God's work of salvation revealed in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let's look at verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. And that is the truth. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. The extravagant grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of the great and extravagant mercy of the great triune God of creation is revealed on Easter Sunday. The life, death, and resurrection had yielded a salvation to any and all who place their trust in Jesus as Lord, Savior, and Messiah. But it doesn't end there. It kind of keeps getting better, and I kind of liken it to one of those late-night commercials. But wait, there's more. Not only are we saved through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, we have given and are promised an inheritance that is beyond our wildest imagination, an inheritance that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, or mind of man imagined, an inheritance that is imperishable. It cannot die. An inheritance that is undefiled, it will always remain pure because it's based on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's unfading. It will never lose its potency or its power. This is the salvation we have in Christ Jesus. Those who are trusting in Christ, those who are pursuing an active and living relationship with Jesus Christ, this promise is yours and no one can steal it from you. Can anybody say amen? Amen. This is guarded for us. It is kept in heaven. Now, we are the crowning glory of God's creation because we're made in the image of God. God saw us as so precious that the Father sent his one and only Son that we could have life eternal through his life, death, and resurrection. There's a preciousness and a treasure that is indescribable that talks about in these passages an inheritance that yields a joy and a peace that nothing else in this universe can give. But why is it being guarded by God? Because it is the most precious and valuable thing that you can possess in this life. The salvation and the promise of eternal life is the most precious gift in this world. However, there's a bit of a paradox in these verses. And we'll talk about that, and it kind of unfolds itself as we continue. But this is the paradox. So here's this assurance of faith that comes in the unconditional love of God. Through that unconditional love of God, God caused us to be born again to a living hope. That cause is God alone. We cannot do anything to earn salvation. We do not deserve God's salvation. Salvation is totally and entirely a work of God. Hallelujah and amen. And in that salvation, those who are actively trusting in him, and there, there's the beginning of the paradox, we have assurance of faith and that promise of eternal life is ours and nobody can take it from you. But the paradox lies between God's sovereignty and free will. God is guarding our inheritance so that no person can steal it. However, we must remain in and cultivate a living faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus said those who endure to the end will be saved. So there's an aspect, and faith is like this. You are either moving toward God or you're moving away from him. There's no stagnancy or coasting. Jesus talks about this in one of the letters to the church in Revelation. I want you either hot or cold. The lukewarm thing just doesn't work. You are either moving toward him or you're moving away from him. There's no middle ground there. And so this tension between God's sovereignty and human free will is a paradox. Both sides of the paradox are in Scripture. Both are necessary. God deals with and offers us his unconditional love through the free gift of salvation and the promise of eternal life. However, he will not force that gift on you. We are described as the bride of Christ. And the bridegroom, Jesus, wants us to give our hearts to him. Not because we have to, but because we want to. He will not force us to love him, nor will he force us to pursue a living relationship with him. He wants us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to pursue an active relationship with our bridegroom, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
God wants us to willingly give ourselves to him, our love, our obedience, and our devotion as an act of worship to a Savior who has truly paid it all. It is a response of faith motivated by love for our bridegroom and what he has done for us. Jesus said, those who endure to the end will be saved. The next thing that we see in our text is in verses 3 through 6. I'm sorry, 6 and 7 we're going to look at. Verses 6 and 7. God purifies and transforms us if we allow him to. God purifies us and transforms us if we allow him to. So now Paul, or P, sorry, Peter, now Peter begins to paint the picture of suffering. I wish I could tell you that spiritual maturity is just going to happen by osmosis and it'll just kind of happen naturally. It doesn't. Unfortunately, most of our spiritual growth happen, happens through suffering. More than any epistle in the New Testament, 1 Peter talks about the theology of suffering in such a beautiful way that it reminds us. And that's why I like all of the scripture readings today, because let's, let's look at this. Peter says this in our text in 1 Peter chapter 1. In this you rejoice. We rejoice in the assurance of faith that comes through Christ Jesus. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's this process of gold being purified. If you know anything about gold, you've got varying degrees of purity. They, they use a, a degree called carats to determine its purity or to label its purity. You've got nine carat up to 24 carat. 24 carat is the purest gold that you can get. The purification process for 24 karat gold is over and over and over. It heats up that gold, it melts it, and all the impurities rise to the top. And they have to do this multiple times because they can't get them all in one shot. It happens over and over. And all throughout the book of 1 Peter is this picture of fire purifying us. That picture of fire is the reality of suffering as we live in a sinful and fallen world. Let's think about Peter for a moment. What did Peter suffer before he became the apostle? What, what caused him and what things happened going from a, an afraid man locked in a room for fear of the Jews to a man standing before those very men willing to lose his life for the gospel and actually counting it a blessing and an honor to be beaten for the gospel? As it says in verse 41 in Acts chapter five. I wonder how much of, how many of we would be glad to be beaten and tortured for the gospel because these beatings weren't just light beatings. But think about the night in which Jesus was betrayed. Peter denied Jesus three times as he was asked, oh, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? He said no three times. And the worst thing about this, and I'm sure when Peter heard the rooster crow, he remembered the words of Jesus. Before he actually denied him, Jesus predicted that Peter would deny Jesus himself three times. Before the rooster crows. When that rooster crowed, it says in the Gospels that Peter wept bitterly. And I don't mean to be gross, but that's like a heavy snot cry where you are so sorry for doing one of the most horrifying things you've ever done in your life. Genuine sorrow just welled up into him. Could you imagine what he felt like when that, when that rooster crowed and the words of Jesus and all of this kind of like bluster in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, I'll go to death with you, I'll battle for you, and pulling even a knife out and cutting off the ear of a soldier. Where did all that bluster and all that confidence go? But more importantly, what happened between the two? Jesus is a loving God and a forgiving God. As Jesus appeared to all the disciples, he, he didn't come and say, you horrible, stupid people. He walked in and said, peace be with you. To people who were doubting, people who were afraid, people who didn't really know what was going on, he gave them exactly what they needed to strengthen their faith. And there's a verse that Jesus says, and in its context, it has to do with our faith, cultivating our faith. He says, ask anything in my name and my father will give it to you. 
And if you want to pray a scary prayer, that prayer goes something like this. Lord, do whatever it takes to cause me to love you more. Lord, do whatever it takes to cause me to love you even more. Jesus breathed on them and the Holy Spirit was given to them. And on the day of Pentecost, we see the true power of the Holy Spirit transforming these 11 ordinary scared men into men of courage. Unashamedly preaching the gospel of Christ because Peter did give his life. He was actually crucified. And because he didn't want to be crucified like the Lord was crucified, he begged them to crucify him upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to die the same way Jesus died. But yet in our scripture lesson in Acts 5, he counted it an honor to get whipped and beaten for the gospel. That's the boldness that I want. And I pray that all of us would desire that too. There is a growing hatred towards the things of the Lord. It's all around us. And I think maybe it's time for us to ask for that fire it's so funny, you think of the wind. There was a wind advisory. It's supposed to start at 11, but I think it started a little early this morning. And that Holy Spirit is kind of like the wind, right? We can't see the wind, but we see the effects of the wind, right? And sometimes the effects of the wind, especially here in South Dakota, kind of shakes things loose a little bit, doesn't it? It kind of takes some of the garbage and blows it away. Maybe that's kind of what we need in our heart with the Holy Spirit, that wind that the Holy Spirit brings that kind of purifies us, shakes those things loose that are hindering our relationship with God, maybe revealing the complacent aspects of our life that we're just unwilling to give up because of maybe either comfort or fear. I want what the apostles received. Oh, I know I can't receive it in the same exact way, but I want as much as God will give me. I don't want to shrink back when it comes down to proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I don't want to be a coward when someone confronts me about what I believe, teach, and confess. I want to boldly stand my ground like Peter did. And if I get put in jail or if I get beaten, I pray that I would respond the way he did. That I would say, thank you, Jesus, for counting me worthy to be beaten for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The final thing that we see in our text is that salvation has an already and a not yet reality. Salvation has an already and a not yet reality. And so look at verses eight and nine. Though you have not seen him, we haven't seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. There's that inexpressibility. Filled with the glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so again, as Jesus appeared to the disciples twice, in these locked rooms and they were locked away because of fear of the Jews. Jesus again in his grace and mercy appeared to them and said, peace be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in a locked room and someone just appeared, I would probably be a little freaked out. And maybe that's a good thing to remind us of the awesome nature of who Christ is. But the second time is Thomas finally, you know, actually the first time, I'm sorry, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. It's a precursor to the day of Pentecost when they will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that will literally transform them into totally different people. But the other thing that's really a blessing in this as you continue through the gospel lesson, as Thomas did finally see Jesus put the, his finger in the nail holes and put his hand in his side where the spear was as he hung on the cross, Jesus makes this remarkable statement that Peter is echoing in our text Jesus says this in John chapter 20, verse 29. He said to them, have you, or said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And so we're blessed to know through the scriptures, to know through the presence, power, and revelation of the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer's heart and mind, revealing to us this truth of scripture bringing that transforming power that transforms us from one degree of glory to another to be more and more like the people God has called us to be and less and less like our sinful and selfish nature that resides within us. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, if you allow it, if you want it, God will work in your heart a passion for Christ that will never waver, 
a passion and a pursuit of what God wants for your life in a way that glorifies him. And unfortunately, a lot of the spiritual maturity that you and I will experience in this life will be based on suffering. I wish it wasn't true, but I'm not going to lie to you. If you flip a few pages further in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says this in verse 12 and 13. Beloved, saved, those who are saved by Christ, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We live in a sinful and fallen world. Of course there's going to be suffering. It's kind of like playing football, and you're the quarterback, and you, you get hiked the ball, you're holding that, that, that football, and somebody tackles you, and you get mad because of it. How, how dare you tackle me? I'm entitled. How dare you, you tackle me? I've got these men, I've got the ball. You have to let me do what I want to do. Is that the game of football? Well, we're on the field of this life. And guess who hates you more than any other person in this universe? The devil. Because you are the crowning glory of God's creation. He wants nothing more than to distract you from what God has for your life. Peter talks about this a chapter later in chapter 5, verses 8 and 10 through 10. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And can I tell you the way lions hunt? They look for the weakest link. Parents, pray for your children. Grandparents, pray for your children and your grandchildren because the devil is going to look for the weakest link in your family. It says, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you had suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And the reality is that even though we have this adversary, the devil and the demons, trying to distract us from the things of God, I'm telling you, because of the blood of Jesus Christ and because of the name of Jesus Christ, they must obey. Can anybody say amen? The precious blood and victory of Jesus Christ protects us from the attacks of Satan. Paul talks about this, putting on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. But I love this promise that God has called us to his eternal glory in Christ and he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you. So yes, there's assurance of faith, but there's also a responsibility. What will you do with the greatest treasure in the universe? What will you do to cultivate an active and living faith? Our faith is very much like a garden. If you want to produce biblical fruit, pull the weeds and water it. The weeds represent sin and distraction in our life, and the watering is the word of God that builds faith because faith comes by hearing and through hearing through the word of Christ. So I pray that we would be emboldened and encouraged and maybe even challenged a little bit here this morning through the words of Peter, through seeing the incredible transformation of his life and the apostles' life who willingly gave their lives for the proclamation of the gospel. May we too have that same boldness, that same courage, but may it all be saturated and guided by the precious, unconditional love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, loving our neighbor as ourself, understanding that Jesus first loved us through his revelation of his love on the cross of Calvary. May we never lose sight of the most precious gift that we can possess in this universe. May we never lose sight of the value of the gift of salvation and the promise of eternal life. Lord, I thank you for this text and I thank you for this great reminder that there's this tension that yes, we can have assurance of faith. Yes, we can know that we know that we know that we are yours and that we trust in you actively and no one can steal that salvation from us. Thank you that you are guarding that for us in heaven. But Lord, I also thank you that you call us to cultivate that living, authentic and genuine faith in you. May we be a bride that does that. May we be a bride that pursues her husband, her bridegroom our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for these things and I pray them all in Christ's name and all of God's people said,